My friends, we are going to grow and get better together. This is not about me. This is about us. Welcome to Win Today with Johnny Martin. Welcome back, friends. Welcome back to another episode of Win Today with Johnny Martin. I am going to cut right to the chase today. We have a uh, phenomenal, phenomenal guest with us by phone. Uh, I just want to talk to you a little bit about the guests that we have in keeping with the theme for the show. And those of you that have listened to the past several episodes, uh, I am more than grateful and appreciative of your continued support of the brand and what we're trying to accomplish in getting people to tap into their talents, strengths, and gifts to write their own story. Uh, the, the gentleman that I'm talking to today, folks, I think epitomizes that in every sense of the word. Um, let me just give you a quick bio on, on um, my guest today, and then we're going to get right into it with him. Um, he is a graduate of Syracuse University, where he, where he was an All-American and captain of the lacrosse team. Got a master's degree from the University of San Diego in global leadership. That in and of itself, from an educational standpoint, uh, is impressive enough. Now let me get to the real nitty gritty of the dude that I have on with me today. Commander, United States Navy, specific United States Navy SEALs, led special forces missions in the Middle East, Africa, Latin America, and other international hotspots. He ran every single phase of Navy SEAL training. He's written two unbelievable books, which we will tag in the show notes. I highly suggest you read them. One of them is author of Worth Dying For. This was April of 2016. And the New York Times bestseller, Damn Few, February 2013. He was a mentor and leader on uh, Fox's hit show, American Grit. And he was the star of the movie Act of Valor. Ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor and pleasure to introduce my friend, the founder and creator of Ever Onward, a brand designed to use Navy SEAL principles to call leaders to take action, to suffer, and be bold so they can perform at their highest levels. I bring to you guys Rourke Denver. What's up, my friend? Yeah, brother. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Oh, it's an, it's an honor. And I know that there is so much ground that we want to cover today. But one of the first things I kind of wanted you to, to get into is uh, when I was going through all of your stuff and your, your bio and all of the things that you're currently doing, the thing that I was drawn to right away and I think will resonate so much with our listeners was the current ethos around Ever Onward, which is enter the hard place where few leaders have dared to go so you can lead like no one else can. And I just wanted to talk to you for a few minutes about that because I think so many of us, when they hear your bio, um, and, and the first thing that a lot of them, and I'm sure you've run into this your whole adult life is, well, how could I possibly live like a Navy SEAL? Um, and I would, I would guess, bud, that so much of your ethos now comes from your, your experience, your accomplishments, your failures, your triumphs. Um, so talk to us a little bit about the ethos and then how those of us that are listening, the, the 99.9% .9 of us that have never been and never will be Navy SEALs, man, how do we go about shaping that in our own lives? Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the ethos comes right out of, uh, of SEAL tradition, but, but much further back than that, you know, warrior culture and warrior traditions. Most of the great, um, you know, warrior cultures have codified what they believe in, what's important to them, what they stand for, their values, um, in a written document of some sort we, we we could talk about 50 of these documents and that that'd probably be worth a a, a second time getting together at some point but sure. you know when i was in the seal teams the first uh you know call it almost 10 years we didn't have a written ethos i mean i think if you asked any seal at that point um you know what's our ethos what do we stand for you get um a hundred different answers a lot of commonalities of course and sure you know we never leave a teammate behind we're always going to advance towards the target we you know well, one one foot in the water, one foot out of it. I mean, all these, all these commonalities would resonate. But you know, at, at one point, one of our senior admirals kind of was banging heads with an army general, that kind of gave him a hard time and said, "Look, you guys haven't even written down what you guys care about. You know, the Rangers have the Ranger Creed and Semper Fidelis and the Marines, and there's all these, you know, documented cases of kind of of, of, of putting this stuff down on paper. And so, so we did that. We did that as a community and took the time to get a bunch of our, you know, senior enlisted, uh, you know, senior officers, junior officers, all these folks kind of out in one spot to kind of craft this document. And you're, you know, your listeners can can Google that. 
Google this seal ethos and you'll, sure. you'll see kind of what it means to us. And, and it occurred to me that this is a good drill for all of us. I mean, all of us know that when you write something down, whether it be a goal, um, you, you know, a, a standard that you want to hold or something you want to achieve, it makes it concrete, right? It gives it, you know, just, I think, gravity. And I, and I wrote that into the ethos on on, on my website, RourkeDenver.com. I, I kind of wrote that, like, look, writing your own ethos is a, is a good drill. I mean, it helps you flesh out uh, things that you believe in, things that are important, and, and, and maybe you rank some of those things. I give, I give kind of some bulletized points to help. I, I have my own written ethos. I consider it a, a living document. So I update it. I take stuff away from it. I add things to it because I think it should be something, um, you know, you don't you don't want to always just you know hold a position for your entire life there's, yeah. there's things that change and you grow and, and so i think you keep it active but i, I just think the drill of, of writing down those things that are important to you whether that's for yourself a business a project you're running your family is a, is a powerful powerful drill and it, and it can it can create a level of accountability for yourself that that's kind of hard to do otherwise yeah I, I totally agree and one of the things that we share sometimes too relative to writing writing down, you know, sort of that win principle. What's important now is is twofold. One, the importance of, as you just mentioned, which I think is great, is to, to keep it fluid. I think some people get stuck in, well, this is what I designed for myself even a week ago or two weeks ago or, or a year ago. But as we know about life, that I think the best leaders and the people that have the most success, whether you're in a leadership position or not, do a really good job adapting to change. Right. And so the no fact doubt. that the fact that the document is a living document, it, it I think forces you as a person, regardless of what you're trying to chase, to constantly self evaluate and to say, Okay, this is what worked, this is what didn't. Um and, and that's I think how we move forward. So I think the point that you made about it being a living document is is phenomenal. And I don't think it's specific to the Navy SEALs or the military. I think it helps anybody who's trying to achieve greater uh that accountability that they need to keep moving forward. So I, I think you're absolutely right. Well, well, there's some pretty great documents that guide this country that are amendable, right? Right. We sure. can amend them. We can we can change and, and manipulate them. And I think that's the genius of those, you know, set of codes and standards is that you can you can revisit them. Now I think you know most of the time if you write it down, you're going to have non-negotiables. You'll have several things on there that you're probably never going to change. And, and in many ways, I hope you wouldn't. But I mean, if I got, you know, the I'm the 44 version current of myself in a room with the 22 year old version <laughs> of myself, I, I got a good. Good, good belief that those two would argue with each other pretty, uh, pretty aggressively on a lot of points, which is, which is good. So absolutely, you know, that's, yeah, that's a, why I think you keep it fluid. It's indicative of growth, right? And hopefully we're growing because yeah. if we're not, we're, we're, we're certainly going the other way. There's no in between. You talked about, it, it's very interesting to me because we talked about this on a previous episode and this just came up from you, which is a great reinforcement on my end. But you talked a little bit about the non-negotiables. Um, if you don't mind sharing, what are some for you that are steadfast that have remained and probably helped put you in the position that you're in, but what, what are the non-negotiables for you? Yeah. I, I mean, a hands down, maybe even number one, you, I could put the family in quotations and of course, you know, all the, all the levels and layers of what family means to me and how I relate to my family. But if I had to put one on there that kind of falls into my ethos, is it something that my, my, my father, I think taught and just really drove home to my brother and I at a very, very young age. And that is to trust yourself, to trust your gut and trust yourself. I mean, I, I just have never um, wanted for, um, a, a lot of, I, I like input and I do tremendous study. I love to research. I love to read and, and I take unbelievable inspiration from others. W what I've come to realize and, and at a pretty young age is I still want to keep my own counsel on most of the important decisions I'm ever going to make. I mean, I, I've made a, a few decisions. I, I can remember a couple very specific decisions that I made based on guidance from other others. And, and, you know, one went really well, and it still kind of bothered me that it, that it wasn't really my choice. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't yours. And then a couple of them went really poorly. And, and you want to talk about being really pissed off sure. at yourself, the fact that you took something from someone else and that that made your decision. And I found the opposite when I when I make my own decision. If it goes well, well, great. I, I get the spoils and now I'm happy about it. When it goes wrong, at least I own it. And, sure. I, and I know it was me and I don't have to feel like I gave some of that away. So, you know, trust yourself hands down. I mean, I feel like you should you should develop a near irrational belief 
in your own ability. I mean, just just to have that belief in yourself and your ability to make good decisions. Is it um, a, is it in a like uh, t- to the degree that you hold yourself accountable and trust yourself when you when you spoke about that irrational belief? When you look at when you reflect on your own life or the life of the the, the great men and women that you've had a pleasure to serve with. Um, do you feel like a lot of them and the people that reach not just in the teams and in the military, but in the work you've done all over the country as a speaker and and your work with your own business, do you find that those that are are climbing to the top, it's almost an obsession? For sure. For sure. I mean, I mean, I think in, in some ways you could, you could, you could in some ways supplant the word obsession with a curse, right? I mean, sure. some of the people that go the farthest are tortured because of that, you know, singular focus and that desire to always be moving forward. And we see it throughout history. I mean, there's people that have been phenomenal leaders and, and created companies that will stand the test of time that were pretty savage people to be around, right? Sure. They weren't the person that you you want to go get a beer with, but they, they might have been the right person for that time to do that job. And I, I, I think, you know, when I talk to leaders, I try and, you know, I try and hopefully give the ability to to, to have have that pursuit to have that hunger and that drive to move forward don't do so crushing crushing the bones of the people that are getting you there you know, on, on 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 the backs of those people so that that's one of the real nuanced um you know nuanced parts of that that, and that, that I, yeah. I think is hugely important yeah. and that i think that also speaks to probably a very intricate level of leadership when you break that that word down and we use it all the time but when you're talking about approaching it the way that you just did with the leaders that you work with and and hopefully that will resonate with some of the people that listen is you know there are varying degrees by which you can measure your own personal growth and so some of the stuff that that Rourke will share and that you and I are talking about right now um you get to a place where you you are hungry to break your leadership style down or the way you live your life down by a certain group of people or by a certain person because you've tapped either all of your other resources or you don't know how to keep climbing on your own. So you really have to break that down into very, very intricate levels so that you you gain a deeper understanding of how far you're really capable of going as a person, I think, right? Yep. No, for sure. For sure. So, so yeah, I'd say, I'd say, you know, one non-negotiable trust yourself. Another would be to train constantly and to suffer, you know, put yourself through hard things. You know, I've got, uh, I've got two kiddos at home and, and if ever, I mean, my daughters have learned if, if they utter the words, you know, this is hard or I can't do this, they, they know they made a mistake because now, now they're going to have to do what they just said they can't do because yeah, and it's, see, uh, and you got to do that. Yeah. And see, you, I you love have that. to do hard things. And, yeah. and I don't you know, inoculate yourself to future hard things by doing hard things, you know, and that comes from training and putting yourself in uncomfortable positions. And then guess what? When something comes out of left field that you're not prepared for and it's uncomfortable and it hurts, you, you're, you're prep. You've done it before. You've done the work. And I think so much of that is lost in, in, um, and I'm, I'm a, a very, very optimistic guy. And I have the great pleasure and honor of working with adolescents every day. But I've noticed over the last nearly 20 years that I've done the the work, Rourke, that what you're just sharing is what's missing from so many of these kids' lives because they have access to everything quickly. Yep. Uh, they are not put in positions a lot of times by their caregivers or parents at home where, you know what, it it's okay to suffer. And, and when you can learn to gain... See, I think... When, when you talk about it, your perspective obviously is going to be different than 99% of the people in this world because of the degree at which you have suffered. But people can still, the takeaway is that whatever the suffer is for you, whatever the suck is for you, you have to put yourself in a position where you work through that because the other side of that discomfort and the other side of that suck is a really beautiful place. And that's really no what helps you grow. That's right. That's right. Yep. Yeah. So I just want to go back for a minute because I think for people and for me specifically and and having a chance to talk to you, how do you go from being a standout athlete at Syracuse University and how do you decide or when do you decide that, you know what, um, the military is something I'm thinking about. And if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it at the very highest level with the SEALs. Yeah, you know, I always like competing and I always liked suffering. I mean, the, the, I, I talk about that, 
you know, suffer and, and doing hard things from a real, you know, kind of personal place and that I, I kind of enjoyed preseason sprints and sports or the worst practices often more than the games. I mean, I love the games, but I just love the grind getting to that great place. Cause look, sure. once you play the, the last game of the year, right? The season's over. So like, I like the build and the, the path to war uh, as much as I like, like the battle. So I mean, I always enjoyed that stuff. And then in my, my senior year of college, and I've, I've told this story many times, but my, my dad, brother and I all love to read. We always share books back and forth. And, and my dad sent me a paperback copy of Winston Churchill's my early life. So uh, the great English statesman that you sure. know, really uh, led, led, led the, the free world through um, World War II you know this this statesman his book that he wrote he wrote much later in life was autobiography about his first 30 years you know he got in little skirmishes in cuba and these frontier wars up in you know the indian pakistani region of the world and then then eventually up in the boer wars of africa where he's a prisoner of war escaped and then about the time he entered parliament there was something about that book that just hit me like a lightning bolt that military service would be the right place for me to start you know he loved to read and write he hated math that was absolutely yeah, my you. life leading up at that point and he was a born leader and then developed his leadership skills out there in the fight and i was like well i feel like i'm a natural leader i feel like i've always been a captain of every team i've been a part of let's push this thing to another place so military service kind of struck me there and then it was just okay let's find the hardest program or the most likely spot i can go get into actual adventures and fights and and at that point it felt like uh, there was so little information about the seal teams but i heard that about 80 percent of the people don't make it through training and that sounded like the right Right wow what an what an yep. unbelievable unbelievable journey and a, a pretty quick sound bite so most of your work in the seals still rourke uh most of it uh as it relates to the missions we documented in your bio uh and then you went on to train seals afterwards correct so you you yes yeah i i got the full spectrum i was real lucky in kind of the jobs i got and 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 then and then the window of history i mean i think um you know, I make a little distinction between, and I say this with utter respect, but a little distinction between a soldier and a warrior. I think there's plenty of folks that join the military to learn a skill, learn a trade, serve their country. They do so honorably, and I, I have nothing but uh, the utmost respect for those people. But they they, they were really doing a, a job and preparing to do that job and, and might not ever see the battlefield based on the specialty they went to. Th then there's those folks that I think are just purebred warriors. They want to pull the curtain back. They want to walk through that 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 valley of death and, and find out what they're made of and what their teammates are made of and go to that ultimate level of, of kind of human interaction that, that takes place on the battlefield. And so, you know, any real warrior kind of hopes for the chance to go, um, you know, go seek their death, right? I mean, this is a, a lot, large part of, of kind of ancient warrior yeah, philosophy. And absolutely. so I feel like I had that inside me. And so the SEAL teams felt like the best place to do it. And then I, I kind of hit the lottery. Now, I, I'm not happy that the world has you know, as best I can tell, descended into a whole lot of chaos. God, but with 9-11 sure unfolding on my watch, you know, we got the opportunity to really go um, do the job. And, and now this current um, era of, uh, you know, of, of, of soldier and warrior in the U.S. military has seen more combat than any generation previously. So yeah, it, it, it um, I got very lucky in the sense that I got to go do all the things I wanted to go do. I got to turn over every stone I wanted to turn over. And then when I got back from my combat rotations, um, I got to, you know, go back to the training grounds and run SEAL training from first phase, which is hell week and all the, you know, kind of stuff that most people see about, you know, the bulk of the attrition with 80% going away up through advanced training um, to kind of give the polished schools to the guys going over the battlefield. So I felt very lucky to kind of do the full, the full circle in the job. That's pretty amazing uh, from a, from a leadership perspective and certainly that warrior mindset, you must take such great pride in, not only the work that you did uh, when you were downrange and with the men you served with, but you must take such great pride in the men you know you helped train and the, and the legacy uh, and the tradition that they'll continue to carry on uh, even after you stepped out of, of the teams and the Navy. It must be an unbelievable feeling when you reflect on that journey as it relates to your experience in the military. Yeah, I think when you you know you see the coaches that coach in you know professional sports that were athletes themselves, and you can tell they're having just as much fun, if not in some ways more so, when they get to hold the reins, run the team, mentor the young folks, and kind of get them ready ready to see what hopefully they saw when they were they were in the fight. So sure. you know when I went through SEAL training, 
we, we had a bunch of capable instructors that were pushing us through the curriculum and pushing us through the training and they knew what they were talking about. But most of those lessons came from like the Vietnam era SEALs, which was plenty of years before I got to SEAL train because that's the last time we were in open full scale combat. And so, you know, a guy would give you a lesson and say, you know, if you do this wrong, you can get your whole team killed. And, you know, if you had any sense of history, you kind of knew you're like, well, oh, yeah, we're, we're all kind of still making that up unless you were in Vietnam, which I can tell you weren't um, based right. on your age. And so, <laughs> When I got to training, the thing that was so great is my instructors, you know, my cadre of instructors. I mean, every one of those guys, multiple combat tours, silver stars, bronze stars, like every combat award you could have, purple hearts. And so, you know, when one of those instructors turns to a young, you know, 18, 19 year old young lion and says, hey, I, I highly recommend you pay attention to what I'm going to say next. This is going to bring you and your teammate home. You had a pretty captive audience. You yeah. Pretty captive be, audience. Because yeah. you knew that they had been there and, and they're yep. not, they're not speaking based on what they read in a history book. They're speaking based on what they've lived with their, with their right. brothers. And uh, so you, you best pay attention. Yeah, uh, for sure. What I, what I want to take a few minutes to do, but is, is um, you know, I love how simple you have kept sort of your leadership philosophy and not just your leadership philosophy, I, I think, uh, as a leader of men in the military, but in the work that you do all across the country for uh, corporations um, and and for individuals. Uh, and for those of you that are listening, we will include all of the sh um, the links to get to Rourke's stuff. But if you if you go to his site and you check out Ever Onward, um, you'll you'll have a real good taste of who this man is and what he's trying to do to lead others and inspire others. But one of the things that really struck me, because when I talk to people all the time, Rourke, and they, I feel like people, not just as it relates to leadership or changing their life, uh, we complicate things that should be kept really simple. Yes. Uh, yes. And, and when I look through your stuff, one of the things that really resonated with me, and I'm constantly looking for ways to improve, but also to help the people that I'm charged with, and, and certainly the people on this space through the, pro the podcast, your leadership philosophy, you kept very, very simple. And so what, I, what I'd like to try to do is let you do just that, man. For the people that are listening, uh, give them a sense of how they can incorporate some of these into their own life. So, we, you know, we start with the first one. Lessons are clear, simple, and well-defined. So I'm a guy who's 40 years old. I'm trying to make a change in my life. Uh, I'm trying to grow and get better as a husband, as a father. Uh, my work with youth, the speaking I do. Or for you guys that are listening out there driving in your car and you're struggling with, with how to get yourself on the right path, lessons are clear, simple, and well-defined. How do, how do we quantify that in our own lives? Yeah, I, you know, I'm going to, I'm working actually, my brother and I are kind of working on a new project that I'll, I'll break out next time we speak, but, you know, we're kind of working on a little bit of that math equation. And one of the things that we've thought of, I mean, we know all of us that complexity is the absolute guarantee of heading into failure. I mean, there are, there are complex tasks and there are con complex con uh, concepts, but in general, execution of most things are, are pretty simple. And if you keep it simple, you've got a really good chance of seeing something through to victory. I mean, when I was in my last assignment, team leader roles we had to give briefs to higher command to get a, a, a an actual mission brief approved that were in excess of like 80 slides on a powerpoint presentation 80 eight zero slides wow and now when i was in ranger school learning basic soldiering skills we'd have a 50-man complex multi-tiered layered um combat uh mission plan that we could draw on the back of like an MRE box, right? Sure. Like a, a single sheet of paper, we could do that entire mission plan on absolutely no problem. And to be honest, I'd brief those 80 page plans to the commanding officer. He'd say yes or no. When it came to actually briefing my team on the missions, now we're going to go out and do the actual job that I just briefed. We'd, we'd brief only two pages. That's all it took. The actions on the objective, the purpose of the mission. Like we didn't need to do anything else because yeah. simple was better. You know, I, I think when I, when I referenced my brother and I working on something, I, I think that person sitting in the car right now feeling the weight of the world wanting to make a change and feeling just this this load on their back that it's going to be a lot to do it i'm not saying it's it's hard it, it's it actually is hard but it is simple and, and you don't need to be a hundred percent better 
to be better, right? Like, I don't think Michael Jordan was 100% better than other people in the NBA. I bet it was under 10%. Now, there's probably an equation we could look at that based on shooting percentages and wins and things like that, but I bet I'm close. I, I don't think he was that much better. He was just enough better to be probably the greatest of all time. We can argue that on any sport or whatever it is. Sure. But it's usually these little measures of increased performance, these inches that we got to look for in the things we do that make huge change in big dividends on the back end, right? So, I mean, I, I say whenever I'm, I'm looking at a task, I, I don't try and figure out, okay, here's, here's the end state. Now, oh, my God, look at all this work I need to do to achieve that. I say, okay, what do I need to achieve in this first hour? What do I need to achieve in this half day, a day? And then we'll start working tomorrow, right? We can only, sure. like, put so much into a given day. And we make some of these goals so complex and so challenging that everyone's going to quit, you know? And that's the problem is most people quit. Right. If That's I could right. if I could import or That's bottle right. one thing from SEAL training to where if I could put it into a, a fizzy drink with a with a bottle cap on it, I'd be flying a private plane to my private <laughs> island from SEAL training. It would be not to quit. Like literally, if we could bottle that no quit juice, you'd be you'd be good to go. You know, I mean, yeah. we'd, we'd be making big dollars. Well, so I think one of the uh, things I think one of the things that you just shared that will stick with me forever and and. This is the first time you've, you know, obviously you've shared it with me. It'll be the first time my listeners are hearing it in this context. But I think when you just shared a minute ago, you do not have to be 100% better to be yep. better. I think that is such a huge lesson, not just from a leadership perspective, but from a growth perspective, right? Not everybody that listens, not everybody that's going through this journey, this beautiful journey that we call life. Not everybody has the goals or dreams or ambitions to be the leader, but they just want to be better in some way, personally better, right. better in a relationship, a better, you know, whatever it is. And I think if you can simplify it, like you just did, and I've never, ever heard that in my life. I've listened to a lot of people speak on leadership. I've, I've read a lot on, on personal growth, but you do not folks have to be a hundred percent better to get better. And I think you need to approach and attack your day uh, a little bit better today than you did yesterday and that I think starts that chain and that, and, and once, once you get moving downhill, you know, then you're going to really pick up steam and start to make some real progress in your life. The, the other one that I, that I love Rourke, uh, and you can certainly elaborate on all of them, but the, but the other one that I loved, and I think the more we can talk about this, um, the better, and it is that life isn't fair. You yep. know, I, I have a son who's 10, a daughter who's eight and, and we go back and forth all the time in our house about well, this isn't fair and that's not fair. And I don't want to just tell them life isn't fair. I want to be able to be a, a, a dad who converses with my kids and ex explains to them what I mean by that. But at the end of the day, I want them to know that it's really that simple. Do you, do you know what it, I mean? It is. It is. <laughs> it is. No, for sure. I mean, and, and look, I, I think... I think game should should be spare. I think sports should be fair. I think those things should be held to a standard so we can all compete evenly and have a chance to win. But you know what God gave you or whatever you believe makes you you. That that is not going to be equitable. It's not the same but level see, for everybody. And, and we, yeah. we we all have these gifts that that we got to figure out how to unpack and develop and use the best of our ability. And I, I've I've yet to meet the person that didn't 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 have one. Yeah. I just haven't met that man or that woman. I, I've met some people that have 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 absolutely shut themselves to believe in they do and, and are unwilling to pursue or work towards getting there. But I, I just think we all have um, varying degrees of gifts, and the best you can do is develop yours and and, and work your tail off and and, and you're, you're going to get a lot further if you did right I mean, that's that's 100, for sure 100 percent. and but the, the comparison you made to athletics i agree with a thousand percent but you but you used one of the phrases you used i want to touch on it for a minute and just get your take on this because i have a a huge issue with this and the work that i do with kids and have for 20 years is that this notion that fair and equal are the same thing in, in no, sports, that's right? right. That's right. In, yeah. in sports and in competition, we certainly want to create equity. We want parity, but in, in, in life and in decision-making as it relates to our growth or people that we're working with, there's still this, this underlying current that fair and equal are the same thing. And I'll be honest with you, man, it drives me crazy because I don't believe at all that, that fairness and equity are the same. Uh, so well, I just the, was the, curious the, the issue that we're, yeah, no, I'm tracking. The, the issue we're having currently and the current 
like lexicon of our country, our culture, and certainly young people, I feel like have now become victim to this. I mean, we have this victim class of people and so on, but is when we talk about equality, the, the thing that's scary is people are now driving towards equality of outcome. And that is BS, right? Equality of outcome means like everybody ends up the same, no matter how, I mean, that's like Garbage. socialism, Marxism, Garbage. communism, the worst of everything, right? We should have equality of opportunity. Like I have no problem with providing quality, equality of opportunity. Like, look, we're going to give everybody a shot, which I fundamentally believe we enjoy in this country. I mean, there's a whole bunch of victim groups that are going to say, and I don't need to name one of them. We all know who they are. Sure. You listen to them every day on the talking heads on the TV, but it's all these people that are, that are victims and, and, and you know, getting their feelings hurt and being offended constantly. And, and those are the people that want a quality of outcome, regardless of how much they're willing to put in effort on it. And that is a path towards destruction as a culture, as a people and as an individual. So, you know, I'm good with, I'm good with equal opportunity. I am not good with equal out outcome. And I still believe in winners and losers. I know that's not PC, but look, we compete to win. You fight to win. And if, if you're one of those people like, Oh, there's no such thing as winning and losing. We've already seen that like everybody getting a blue ribbon is leading down a bad path, you know? And that's not the way I grew up. I grew up as like one person got a blue ribbon. Ribbon. That's first right. I got across the finish line first, that, you know, that's and, right. and look, I didn't get blue ribbons every time and it pissed me off when I didn't. So I went and worked harder to go get one the next time. That's you know? exactly so it's, right. Uh, yeah. Young people need to need to kind of wake up when it comes to that world and, and, and parents, it, the onus is on them and teachers and mentors and pastors and coaches that, that have to, you know, drive into them that that's that, that, that ain't the world the way the world works. No, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And, uh, of all the leadership lessons in the real simple, there's a seven step philosophy that you've outlined. I, I highly encourage those of you that are listening when you, when you, if you're commuting to work, when you're listening to this right now, when you get to your office or get to your house, check it out, go to ever onward or go to RourkeDenver.com and just take a look at his leadership philosophy. There's seven steps. We've talked about a couple of them. I'm going to outline them quickly. We're going to take a quick break on the next, uh, episode of win today with johnny martin we're going to continue this conversation uh with navy seal global leader and just an all-around really really good human being rourke denver but those seven are lessons are clear simple and well-defined winning pays losing has consequences nothing substitutes preparation as we just talked about life is not fair the smallest details matter and success depends on team performance Again, having a phenomenal conversation with my friend Rourke Denver. Uh, the next time you join us, we were going to continue this conversation. As always, folks, I'm grateful uh, for your attention to this space. Uh, certainly couldn't do it without you. Be good to those you love. Let them know you love them and have a great day. Thank you to Seven Roads Media and Cloud9 Marketing Group for co-producing the show. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe on whatever platform you're on. Without you, I cannot continue to do what I love. You can follow me personally on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Real John C. Martin. I'd love to hear from you, so please reach out with comments and questions after each episode. Your comments push me to get better every day. As always, thank you for your continued support, and don't forget, win today.